do everything remote. We're going to do everything remote, and that way we're going to be fine, and there won't be any interruptions because if we tried to do this on the E3 show floor, everything would fall apart. Uh, and yet we run into the same technical problems as always. It looks like we are back on, though. Uh, we've got the stream going. We've got you on the line. All is well. So you were starting to say before you were talking about uh, the, the exciting uh, Xbox announcement and the fact that you guys are part of... Remind me what the name of the Microsoft program is again, because it's not early access. It's called something else. It's called Game Preview, yeah. Um, but essentially, philosophically, it's the same thing as Early Access on Steam with a couple of slight variations. So Microsoft has taken a little bit more of a curated approach. Mm. So they've handpicked certain titles um, for the program. Uh, we were we were announced yesterday along with Elite Dangerous as being the two to launch the program. So you can actually buy The Long Dark on Xbox One right now in Game Preview. Mm -hmm. And essentially the idea there is to just open up to console players what PC players have had for a while, um, which is to get involved with games that are unfinished, still in development, and you know participate in the development of the game by providing feedback and being part of the community throughout. Um, there's also a trial mode, which is kind of one of the pillars of, their, of Microsoft's Game Preview, where you can try the game for an hour and make an informed decision about whether or not it's something that you think you're gonna like, and whether you wanna put your put your money down to, to play that so yeah it's a pretty you know for us it's great we've been you know part of early access for the last nine months we've learned a lot of things about the game and about the community and just the process of, of creating the game with that community informed model mm. and I we were really excited when Microsoft approached us um, you know to ask if we wanted to be part of this new program for them um, because you know honestly it's 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 a it's a great experiment for us to open the game up to an audience that hasn't grown up on PC. So, you know, the survival genre that we're in, sort of find ourselves in is something that's kind of a phenomenon on, on Steam right now, and I think it's kind of grown up in that space. And, you know, for us, it's, it's, it's almost like discovering a whole new ecosystem of players that's grown up in isolation of that audience. And so I'm very curious to see what kind of feedback we get from them in terms of because our game is very different from what they probably have already played. It's a much and, slower. Uh, it's a much slower paced. It's a much more sort of thoughtful thing. You know, I think a lot of console gamers that have come up in the past decade playing Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 games are used to something that's a little bit more forgiving, something that kind of holds their hands. And The Long Dark is very much the opposite of that. Exactly, and you know, we built the whole design of the game around those principles of not holding the player's hand and in a lot of ways because most of my team comes from that AAA console background we all kind of reacted to that with the game wanting to create an experience that didn't hold their hands and kind of really provided an actual challenge and when players had successes they would feel like those were their own successes as opposed to the game kind of spoon feeding them content mm -hmm. and so you know obviously we're hopeful that the console audience will really embrace what we're providing and, and we recognize that it's definitely very very different from anything else that's out there i'm curious how has the long dark changed over the past year i mean the last time that you and i spoke and we streamed the long dark actually for joystick when joystick uh, was still a going concern before it got folded into end gadget and it was a very, very, mu it was a rougher game than it is now. Like, even just mm -hmm. playing it for a few minutes today, this morning, I was immediately like, wow, this is a demonstrably different game. But how has The Long Dark grown in the past year, you know, from, say, E3 2014 to E3 2015? What's different? You know, it's interesting because it's, looking back on the core game as it existed a year ago, as you said, definitely it was a clunkier experience. We've been able to improve a lot, you know, just the overall user interface and the, and the player experience in terms of how the game feels with tuning and movement and all that type of thing. But what's interesting to me is that the fundamentals of the game haven't really changed. Um, the game is much bigger now. You know, the world is probably five times, uh, actually six times bigger than it was about a year ago wow. in terms of the sheer square footage of the world. There's a lot more content. We have a much deeper crafting system now. We've added bow hunting. We've added actual hunting and stalking gameplay so that you can, you know, hunt animals properly. We've added uh, a lot of new gear items. 
Um, and, you know, as I said, the world is just bigger. So we've refined a lot of mechanics. Um, the core survival experience and having to, you know, maintain your condition by managing your, your hunger, thirst, your, your fatigue, and your um, cold, those mechanics haven't really changed. And certainly we've tuned them over, to- over time. Um, but I, I actually take it as a, as a really great endorsement of the game that, that people have embraced the core experience that we put out in front of them about a year ago, and it's essentially just been a process of refining those ideas and expanding the world. And one of the things that we added about three or four months ago that has been pretty exciting and interesting is we, we added the idea of ex- what we call experience modes, which is it's kind of like difficulty modes, but it's, it's, we don't like to frame it in that way because, let's be honest, the game is difficult no matter what. Hmm. But um, we added three experiences, Pilgrim, Voyager, and Stalker. And Stalker is what I consider to be like the pure survival mode. So people who are looking for a really, really challenging survival experience and, and want it to be punishing will play that we'll play that mode. And that's, you know, the Stalker name is kind of derived from the Russian soccer games or the Ukrainian soccer games just because we they were a big inspiration for me when we were, you know, coming up with the concept of Raphael, the beginning. Raphael, I, I gotta Voyager. tell you, I totally, like, as soon as I fired it up, I have not played with the different, the three different experiences before, and I immediately was just like, Pilgrim, Pilgrim, I'm gonna take it easy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna relax yeah. a little. Pilgrim is, you know, Pilgrim is actually one of the more interesting outcomes of that experiment because we discovered that you know more than 30 percent of our players at least on steam and i'm, I'm really curious to see what our xbox players do but more than 30 percent of our players on steam w- play on pilgrim and what we've discovered is that we have this large audience of people who love the environment and just want to soak up the world that they're as they're walking through it and for them it's almost more of like a thoughtful emotional kind of poetic experience on most of like watching sunrises and sunsets and standing on the top of mountains like watching the wind blowing and looking at wildlife far away where you know it's safe and you know it's just been amazing for us to be able to like play, put a game in front of people that can be so many things to so many people even though the core mechanics are the same across the board we can kind of tune it under the hood to provide these different experiences for different types of players and you know it's just so that i would say that is one thing that we've added that's had quite a great impact on kind of how people experience the game. Well, you know, like, you guys have very much been at the forefront of the, you know, the early access movement in the past two years. You guys are uh, a developer that is very much in front of your audience and saying, help us build this game. You know, you're you're not, you, you don't sort of take that step back and then deliver your update and say, well, you know, give us your notes. You guys are constantly tinkering. And I'm curious how your interactions with the PC audience, since the Long Dark, you know, was playable in early access last year, how have your experiences with that audience informed how you're going to approach working with the, you know, Xbox audience? Because that's going to be a very different crowd, as you were just talking about. How are, how are you going to approach that community based on the lessons you guys have learned already? I think there's two key things for us. The first one being our general approach to how we deal with player feedback. And at, we're very, very upfront with our community about the fact that, you know, this is, we have a very clear vision for what we want to create for them with the long dark. So when we talk about community informed development, we're talking about bringing them into our process and hearing what they have to say about the game, but we're not, we're not putting them in the driver's seat. We're not saying to them, what do you guys want the game to be? And what do you want the, you know, what features should we work on? I mean, we have a roadmap. We have an idea of what we want the game to be and how we want it to evolve. And I think it's important that our players understand that, you know, they can have confidence in us, that we're a professional team of game developers. We have, you know, we know what we're doing. We have a goal. We have a plan. This isn't going to be one of those projects that kind of lingers and in development forever and ever. Like, we are going to launch a story by the end of this year, and that's going to be the end of our open development process, at least for the first iteration of this of this IP. So I think that's actually been a message that's resonated really strongly with our community because they, they feel confident sort of putting their money and putting their trust in us because they know we listen to them and we're interested in hearing their feedback and we respond to that feedback. And you can see in every single update that we've done, you know, most of the content that's in there even though a lot of it might have been derived from our own internal wish list, it overlaps heavily with what the community wants. So it's been a really good, like, symbiotic relationship that we've had with them. But I think they always know that we're really in the driver's seat and we have a goal, we have a vision, and we know what we're doing. And so I think it's, it's been interesting because I know there's other projects that have been a lot more open with that and say, like, you tell us what you want us to do and we'll just do it. And what we've found with our community is, is they, they 
they come to us from some of these other early access games and they and they say, you know, that game got ruined by the community because the developers didn't have a plan, they didn't know how to deal with the feedback and they got overwhelmed. And and we've always been really straight up with our community from the very, very beginning saying, you know, this is our game, we have a vision, but we want you guys to be part of this with us and help us make it better and tell us what you think about the things that we're putting in front of you so that we can improve them. So that's that's been our message and that's been something we've been really firm about throughout the process and I think it's been working really well for us. And I think Taking that message over to the console audience, I think will maybe mitigate some of the like the concern about the working in a more of an open development um, alpha model, which is completely new to the console audience. They've never had that before, so I think that's pretty key. And and just generally, other than that, I think it's the second thing is that we do have a very very positive community. I mean, if you think about what Steam can be in its worst, you know, iterate incarnation in terms of how the community can be, I would say we have one of the strongest. Um, on Steam and outside of Steam in our official community as well. And they really are. I gotta say, you guys don't really have. You guys don't have belly acres. Everybody is pretty cool in the long dark community. I have to say, it's noticeable. Yeah, it's true. And I think some of that goes back to what you started saying about the game, which is that it is a bit more of like a thoughtful kind of game experience that's a bit more artistic, a bit more of a, I guess, an emotional experience than. It's not a zombie game, it's not a game where we're running around shooting people in the face, like it's really, I think it attracts a certain type of player, and I think that's why our community is the way it is, and, and of course, when we have 350,000 players on Steam alone, of course you're going to have some number of those people are going to be creepers and they're going to be complainers or whatever, and I find that what happens is the community itself is quite good at kind of policing that, because there is this critical mass of people that are really, like, reasonable, have strong opinions, but can communicate like adults and really want to have that type of community as opposed to the other toxic community that you see kind of everywhere else. So I think that's a great opportunity for Xbox players to come into a community that's already mature, that already has that kind of culture built into it, and hopefully will be a much like nicer process for them than maybe if they were dropped into some of the other communities that are out there. And then sort of the follow-up to that, because we have been doing community relations and community interaction for all these months, and we have a good rapport with our community, we know how to talk to them, we are able to provide, like, to support our Xbox players with the community properly because, um, you know, Steam has the community built into the platform, but Xbox doesn't have that notion because, let's face it, people don't play Xbox with, you know, keyboards in front of them so they can write notes, right? Right. Um, so it's, it's, it's in, you know, so what's going to happen is, you know, people will play the game on Xbox and then they'll hopefully take their notes and think about what they're playing and they'll take the time to come to our forums and they'll, you know, create an account and they'll sit down and write their feedback. And, you know, we're going to do everything we can to be welcoming and to help them streamline that process of getting into the community because we want to hear that feedback. So, you know, I guess it, it's bigger picture. It's really, you know, the experience that we've been able to build over over the time that we've been on Steam and the fact that our community is so strong already is, I think, one of our, our, our um, you know, best hopes for making this game preview process as smooth as possible for Xbox players. Uh, so you had mentioned that, you know, no, no uncertain terms, Long Dark is coming out as a finished game later this year. By the end of 2015, we're going we're gonna to see Long Dark as a game that is complete, that is uh, reviewable, if you want to say that way. Like, something that somebody can just go, go buy it, and it's, it's gone. Uh, so, I'm curious, you also said that, like, that's it for this iteration, that you're going to have your complete Long Dark before the end of 2015, but you guys are going to continue working with it. What's the future for the Long Dark? Where is this going beyond this year? Right, so the so we've always talked about the game as being kind of two experiences. One is the sandbox, the survival sandbox, which is the open, non-narrative kind of freeform experience that people are playing right now. And then the story mode, which is an episodic, narrative-based experience that's layered on top of the core mechanics that are in the sandbox. So when I say there's going to be a like a full long dark experience that launches by the end of the year, that is you know the first episodes of season one of our story mode. Our uh, the future of the long dark is to continue releasing those episodes, kind of in the same model that we've seen from like the Walking Dead episodic game, for example, where they do like the seasons pass and they have the, seasons, the episodes kind of mapped out. And we're going to unlock however many we're going to unlock when we launch, and then there'll be some follow-up episodes that come later in 2016. And then, you know, players willing, and you know, we hope that we have a lot of support from the community, and people really enjoy what we've given them in story mode, and we, and we have great success with it, and we want to continue. And we've always sort of conceived of the Long Dark as being 
this bigger experience that spans multiple seasons. So, I mean, right now it's obviously winter and this whole storyline built around that experience. What we'd love to be able to do is take that, take those characters that we're going to introduce in story mode, take the storyline that we've introduced in story mode and continue building on that in the future. So we go to spring, we change the sandbox mechanics you know, to make more sense within that environment. We go to maybe a slightly different part of the world to freshen up the experience and we continue moving that storyline forward. Our, our grand design would be to do a full year of the long dark, so oh, a year wow. one. Wow, that would be so get cool. Get to go through, yeah, each of the four seasons. Now, I mean, that's the ambition. We'll have to see what we can actually accomplish in the long run, and a lot of it's just going to come down to the practicalities of like what the audience thinks and 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 how well it does when it launches for like the full version launches. But you know, if the if the early you know response is any indication, we feel very confident and excited that you know we, we we know that a lot of people that are playing sandbox right now are, are playing it because they're they're waiting for that story mode experience to come out and we've talked a lot about you know the great voice cast that we have with mark here jennifer hale david Hader, and the last stuff back to so four of the like strongest most prominent voice actors in games that have played amazing characters in other games are, are lending their talents to this project so we're really serious about building this out as, as a really story driven uh, experience we have you know as i said grand designs for this moving forward you know players willing will be able to do that we're just you know really we love this IP we love this story that we're telling we love the experience of being in the in the wilderness and having this kind of really thoughtful careful kind of survival thing and, and we're really hoping we can kind of just continue pushing that forward Raphael we have a couple of questions here from the chat Pinutro who is a, a, a lover of the game it would seem Pinutro has two questions uh, he, he was wondering, are there going to be upgrades for weapons, and also, will there be four zones in the complete version? Those are Pinutro's two questions. Well, thanks for your questions, Pinutro. So, in terms of weapon upgrades, I mean, as you know, because you're a big fan of the game, the combat's not really a big part of what we do in the long dark. Uh, mostly you're using the rifle, and now we added the bow recently, and these are essentially, we refer to them even as tools. We don't even talk about them as weapons. And they're really meant to just facilitate things like hunting or protecting yourself from wildlife when you get in a bad situation. Now, at some point, fairly soon, we will be introducing some other AI survivors. Obviously, our story mode will depend on having other people in the world as opposed to you just wandering around by yourself as you are right now. So you can kind of imagine some of the scenarios that you might end up in when that happens. And so the, those tools, the bow, the rifle, and whatever other tools we may put in the player's hands, um, to deal with those types of situations, you can kind of imagine how we might evolve that. But in terms of actual upgrades, like a, uh, you know, like a, uh, like a weapon modification like a type laser of thing, scope. Like some yeah, like no, we probably won't have laser scopes. I mean, some people have to scope and scope on the rifle, and you know, it could be something that we that we that we add later on. It, it's not, it doesn't feel very philosophically aligned with how the game mechanics work right now. Um, so I, I don't really see that being a big part of what we get in the future. But again. We're always refining, you know this, right? We're always refining the sandbox, we're always refining the gameplay. We're always looking for new ways to kind of create an opportunity for more interesting player choices. And that's fundamentally what everything is about in the game, is just putting tools and, and giving choices to the player where they have to, you know, they put themselves actually in some pretty like interesting situations because of their own decisions, not only because of the things that happen to them in the game. And one of my favorite quotes ever about our game is, you know, most of the time, what kills you in the long dark is yourself, right? It's because of the thing that you chose to do. Not the game didn't kill you; is that you put yourself in a situation where the, where you died because you made a, you made a certain choice that ended up being a bad one. Um, the second question about zones: We currently, the, so the game is currently 25 square kilometers, so I think that's about 16 square miles or whatever across the three major regions we have. All the three major regions are uh, connected with significant travel zones that are kind of a little bit more linear, but they're pretty substantial areas of their own. We're continuing to expand that world. Um, I don't, I can't say for sure how many like regions we will have when we launch, but the game is getting bigger, the world is getting bigger, and I will say that story mode has regions that are unique to it. So when if you've been playing the Long Dark for you know the last several months, when you play story mode, you will certainly find you will pass through areas that you've been playing that are familiar to you, but you will also be playing in areas that are completely unique that you've never seen before, and so that maybe gives you a little bit of a sense of, of what to expect. Uh, one other question here from Warning Track: Are there plans to have plants grow back over time? It's a good question. Um, yeah, and we get asked that a lot, actually. So n there, there are no plans to have plants grow back, partly because it's winter. 
Um, and as you know, like most of the things, um, other than wildlife, really, uh, most of the resources in the game are not respawn. They don't respawn. So what you start with in a, in a session is what you have to work with, essentially, to survive for as long as you can. And that's really been a pillar of our design from the very beginning, and, and I don't I don't really want to um, undermine a lot of what's great about the game by, by fiddling with that too much. I will say that we have been exploring some ideas on how to introduce uh, items and loot back into the world in pretty organic ways um, that might be unexpected, and something that we're working on right now um, because we, you know, we do recognize that you know at some point when you survive for 100, 150 days and you're kind of down to hunting and creating your own clothing and whatnot, it might be really nice at some point to you know discover uh, another cache of human-made supplies or whatever you're in there. Yeah, so, so we what are, are, we what are, are your ideas for that? If you want to get specific, like, are you going to have like events? Do you see a plane crash and all of a sudden you can take what's coming out of the plane, or you know, how do you naturally incorporate things like? Well, I don't want to give anything away, but it's 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 kind of stuff along those lines. Maybe not quite, you know, as epic as planes crashing and whatnot, but certainly more environmental systems that allow us to refresh things in a more natural way, um, apart from having things grow back. Um, so you can imagine, for example, bringing human, other human survivors into the into the conversation does open that opportunity. So now you can potentially have the opportunity to trade, or you can, you know. Um, Potentially, you can attack other survivors and take their things, or whatever you might choose to do. That what that what might be one system that we would you know use to, to kind of refresh the things. But generally speaking, the the answer to the question of like will plants grow back, the answer is no. We will continue to expand that system of natural remedies and harvesting things from the environment that you can use for crafting and for creating first aid, uh, you know, tools and things like that. But we won't have uh, plants like you know magically grow back after you've harvested them. Uh, Raphael, that is, uh, that is unfortunately all the time we have today. Uh, you have any messages that you want to deliver to, to your fans? I know that you can get The Long Dark on an Xbox One right now. Um, yeah, is there anything you'd like to tell everybody before we sign off? No, I just want to say on behalf of the team that we really appreciate all the support that we have from our community. I mean, you're a huge part of why we do what we're doing. And, you know, we, we hope that we can continue living up to your expectations. And we're just really excited to continue evolving this thing and, and delivering something really special and amazing to you later in the year. Awesome. Uh, Raphael, thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great, great E3. Uh, everybody, continue watching. We will be live again in just two minutes. We're going to be talking with Kobojo about their game Zodiac, a new JRPG that has the writer of Final Fantasy VII working on it and the composer of Final Fantasy Tactics. Stay tuned. We will be right back. Bye-bye, Raph. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. All right, take care. Oh, <laughs>